Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. We take your phone calls during that hour. We have an open phone line. Right now there's actually no lines open on it. <clears throat> Our switchboard is full. But I'm going to give you the number anyway. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian life or the Christian faith that you'd like to ask or if you have a different viewpoint from that of the host and would like to discuss that here, that's what this uh, line is for. And uh, although our lines are full at the moment, they won't be forever. And we're going to talk to these callers. Lines will open up. If you want to have this number handy, you can call in in a few minutes and maybe catch the line that becomes available. The number is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. One announcement, uh, and that is that tomorrow being Thursday, we have our early morning Bible study in Southern California in Temecula, 6.30 in the morning every Thursday uh, at Panera Bread in Temecula. Uh, that's a study in the life of Christ, going through the four Gospels, harmonizing them. If you'd like to join us, open to the public. Welcome anyone who happens to be in the area or wishes to come into the area for that study. Uh, Thursday mornings. That's tomorrow, 6.30 in the morning, Panera Bread in Temecula. All right, that's all I need to announce. Let's talk to Bruce from Whittier, California. Bruce, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Thank you for taking my call. Um, sure. Got a question. Adam and Eve, um, do you believe the first sin was uh, when Eve took the apple? Well, it, we're not told if it was an apple or not, but it was a it was a fruit of a forbidden tree that we we're told she ate. Now, I tend to take that literally, uh, but you know, some people might take that symbolically that there was something else that was forbidden that it's symbolically referred to as eating from a tree. I don't I don't generally take that view, but there are people who do. I think uh, I think the first you know recorded sin was therefore the eating of that forbidden fruit. Well, I, I just threw out apple. I don't care what it was. But uh, how about the fallen angel, the serpent? Would that be considered the first sin? Well, if it is, it's not the it's not a sin that took place uh, among human beings. So it would not be part of human history. Uh, I don't really know that. Yeah, you know that that the serpent was a fallen angel. Uh, we don't. We're not given any information about that. We're simply told that the serpent was the most subtle and, and crafty of all the creatures that God had made. Uh, we understand from the New Testament that Satan was involved in that temptation. The serpent was a creature that God made, uh, but Satan apparently took command of that animal for the purpose of deceiving Eve. Uh, if, in fact, an angel sinned and became the serpent, as many people believe, became Satan, then, yes, that was earlier than, than man's sin. But it was not part of human history. It was part of pre, pre-human pre history. Okay. Well, thank you, Steve. All right. God bless you, Bruce. Good talking to you. All right. Our next caller is uh, Mark from New York. Mark, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. You're welcome, Steve. I'm looking in Zechariah 13, 7 where it says that it's a famous quote that Jesus right. uses, right. smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Can we attribute this chapter to be the new covenant and the age that we are in now, as opposed to the premillennialist view that this passage is possibly a millennial kingdom I believe the we can. I ask that, yeah, the reason I, I ask that is because I can probably find a premillennialist to bring up verse 2, which says, I will cut off the names of the idols and no more be remembered, which certainly does not encapsulate today because we have many people uh, idolizing various idols. So what's your take on Zechariah 13? Well, of course, it says in verse 2 that I'll cut off the names of the idols from the land, meaning the land of Israel. <clears throat> and certainly that happened when Jerusalem was destroyed. But uh, the whole section 
of uh, Zechariah chapters 12 through 14 is very commonly applied to the end of the age. That is, the nations coming against Jerusalem in chapter 12 are thought to be something that's yet going to happen in our maybe in our time or in the future time. And then, of course, chapter 14, uh, when it talks about how the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, many people understand that to be a reference to the second coming of Christ. <coughs> and, uh, and then what follows in chapter 14 is often applied to the millennium, and applied to what will happen after Jesus comes back. So probably most teachers apply it that way, uh, that chapters 12, 13, and 14 actually belong to the uh, end of the age. But you pointed out in verse 7, it says, Smite right. the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And Jesus quoted this. He said, This will be fulfilled when all of you right. forsake me. Yeah, in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said this was fulfilled. So we have from Christ himself a time marker for this section. And right. by the way, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are one continuous prophecy, <clears throat> one continuous uh, oracle. So if mm -hmm. Jesus identified the very center part of this with, uh, you know, his betrayal and his arrest and the disciples fleeing from him, then he's given us a, a good time marker for it. And also uh, we find that uh, it, later on in chapter 14, it says, in that day, living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. Now, Jesus, yeah. in uh, John chapter 7, stood up at the mm -hmm. Feast of Tabernacles in verse 37 of John 7. He said, if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, when Jesus said, as the scripture has said, he's clearly referring to something in the Old Testament because there were no New Testament scriptures. But where in the... Old Testament, do you find a prediction that living waters will flow from the from the bellies of those who believe in Christ? Well, there's only right. one place, only one place in the whole Old Testament that even mentions living waters flowing. So this is probably the passage he had in mind where he says, in that day, it shall be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem. In this case, Jesus said, mm -hmm. well, they're going to flow from those who believe in me. Yet in the New Testament, yeah. the writers often equated Jerusalem with, with the believers, with the church. Uh, as we see, for example, in Hebrews 12, where he said, we have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, to the city of God, and so forth, which he also calls the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So the church in the New Testament is sometimes referred to as Jerusalem. And many of the passages in the Old Testament that are about Jerusalem are sometimes applied to the church. For example, in Isaiah uh, 28, 16, I think it is, it says that, behold, I lay in Zion for a, a foundation stone, a chief cornerstone, uh, referring to Jesus. Right. Now, Jesus is not the foundation of Mount Zion, the literal Mount Zion, but he is the foundation of the church, which, of course, Hebrews 12 identifies with Mount Zion Amen. and the heavenly Jerusalem. So, so it's very common in the Old Testament to speak of Jerusalem and have it refer, in the, as far as the New Testament writers are concerned, to the church. So when living waters flow from Jerusalem, Jesus made that promise that living waters, as the scripture has said, and I don't know of any scripture in the Old Testament he could be referring to other than this one, will flow out of the believers. And then John says in John 7, 30, and this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So John implies that the fulfillment of this would be when Jesus is glorified and when the Holy Spirit is given. Well, that happened, of course, less than a year after Jesus predicted it. So we're looking at time markers here that sound to me yeah. like they're talking about the first century, not not the 21st century. Also in Zechariah chapter uh, 12, a famous yeah. passage that many people like to apply to the end times, where it says in yeah. verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look to me whom they have pierced. I believe this refers to Pentecost. The, the, exactly. spirit, was poured, the spirit was poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and, and many of them uh, looked on him who, whom they had pierced, uh, after all, they were the generation who had done so. In fact, Peter on that very day told them, this Jesus you have crucified by the hands right. of unlawful men. So, so, I mean, these passages, I think many people don't know what to do with this kind of passage in Zechariah because most Christians are not very familiar with apocalyptic imagery. And, uh, mm -hmm. and yet it's very, very common in Zechariah and in Daniel and Ezekiel, a few other books. Uh, Zechariah is very apocalyptic in its style its vision. So 
I think this is talking about the first century, and it, I believe the, the prophecy is about the ending of the Old Covenant and the coming of the New. There's nothing in here about a millennium, and there's not even anything in here about a second coming of Christ. You know, in, in chapter 14, which is part of this discussion, verse 4, it yeah. says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. Now, many people right. assume this is the second coming of Christ. They say, well, Jesus is going to come back and step on the Mount of Olives and he'll split too. Where they get, where do they get that? They get it from, <laughs> they get it from this verse. This There's passage, no other, right? Yeah, no, no other place in the Bible speaks of Jesus coming back to the Mount of Olives. True, the angels on the Mount of Olives said he'll come back in the same way. He didn't mm -hmm. say he'd come back in the same place, but here, this doesn't mention anything about Jesus. It's talking about Yahweh. Yahweh will stand right. on the Mount of Olives. Now, Yahweh, of course, we we understand Jesus to be Yahweh incarnate but it's yes. extremely uncommon if if it's found at all in the old testament to refer to the messiah as yahweh it's talking about yahweh judging jerusalem standing on the mount of olives means that yahweh has left the temple he's left the city he's no longer there yes. to protect it and we ha we know this because ezekiel used exactly the same image when god abandoned the city of jerusalem to the babylonians in ezekiel 11 he talks about how the glory of the Lord left the temple, walked out through the mm -hmm. eastern gate, walked up and stood on the Mount of Olives that's east of Jerusalem. And that was God's way of saying, I'm no longer in the city. Your enemies can have it. Okay. And so Ezekiel had that imagery of God standing on the Mount of Olives that is outside the city, not protecting it any longer from within. And that gave them the city vulnerability to the Babylonians. Now, Zechariah is writing after the Babylonian episode. Right. And he's predicting the same thing going to happen in by the Romans. Right. Good point. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Okay. I appreciate your call. And by the way, anyone who thinks that's a, a strange uh, way of looking at this, I would encourage you to listen to my free lectures. Everything at my website's free. But I do have verse-by-verse -verse lectures through every book of the Bible, including Zechariah. And I do give a lot of attention to these chapters at the end of Zechariah. And I compare them with New Testament. I compare them with Old Testament passages. And I, you know, I explain them in a way that, honestly, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody explain them the way I've done. So because nobody that I've ever heard explains them very thoroughly, uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Uh, there are people who have, I'm sure. I'm just saying I haven't heard them. So if you're interested in Zechariah, lots of people have called and asked me about Zechariah 14 especially. Check it out at the website, thenarrowpath.com. Under verse-by-verse -verse lectures, check out Zechariah and pick out those chapters, and you'll get a much more uh, thorough treatment of it. I appreciate your call about that, Mark. Uh, Mike from Maryland, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Really appreciate your work. It's just extremely valuable. Thank um, you. I am interested in hearing your view of the theory that um, the seemingly long ages of the patriarchs in Genesis um, actually stems from a misunderstanding of the Hebrew word translated year in those passages. And the form of this that I'm interested in is, is I understand there's quite a bit of ancient testimony to the fact that cultures around the Middle East used to call originally a month a year and then later transferred to like a three or four month season as a year. And if you, you know, if you sort of go back and take the earliest patriarchs from Adam to, to Noah and, you know, treat it as a, as a month-long year, divide by 12, you get ordinary lifespans. And then similarly for the next batch of patriarchs, if you use a season-length year, mm. again, it transfers to sort of ordinary um, ordinary lengths. And I think there are some biblical hints that that, that right. sort of intended as well. But I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, in order, for, in order to refute that, I would have to know that those uh, – that those premises are true. In other words, that in the ancient Hebrew world, that they spoke of a month as if it was a year or a, a season of months as if it was a year. If that is true, then that's an interesting point. Now, I've never seen any evidence of that, and, and I don't know how we'd have any because I don't think we have any, well, we certainly don't have any history of the Hebrew world uh, ways of speaking about such things any older than the Bible itself. And I don't think the Bible itself gives us any reason to to look at it that way. So 
if there's extra biblical information that scholars have found, perhaps in Sumerian texts or something that some Middle Eastern peoples used to speak that way, uh, that has not been brought to my attention. It's an interesting theory. Uh, I've, I myself have not had great difficulty accepting the, the, the ages of those patriarchs at face value, but that's partly just because I tend to believe what the Bible says. But if it's actually saying something else, uh, if I'm misunderstanding their manner of speaking, then I'd, I'd be glad to know it. Uh, now, you've heard that. I had not heard that. Do you know of any anyone who has cited uh, primary authorities on on this you know, policy? Yeah, there's, I mean, it's, it's a little bit old. There's a guy named Rask who collects a lot of this. This is not about the Hebrews. This is about uh-huh. the Egyptians and um, I see. Uh, Sumerians and stuff. Okay. Well, possibly. I, could, I mean, because... I could get it. I could post it for you on your website on theos.com sure. or theos.org. Yeah, or, or just... You, or, or you could... Yeah, you could do it that way if you want to, theos.org, or, or you could uh, email me, whatever you prefer. I would like to uh, see that. Because, I mean, if the Egyptians, in fact, did that, there's no reason to assume that Moses wouldn't uh, do that since he was raised in Egyptian culture, and he may have adopted Egyptian ways of reckoning such things. But I had never heard any authorities say so, but I would not be close-minded about it. Okay. I appreciate appreciate it. I'll, I'll shoot that over to you one way or the other. Okay, Mike. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks. Good talking to you. God bless you. All right. Uh, let's talk to BJ from Round Rock, Texas. BJ, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Um had a Bible study this morning on uh, uh, Matthew chapter 19, not 18, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the, 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 there's a rich young ruler in that. Uh huh. In that one. Um, yes. One thing I've always heard about the the rich young ruler, uh, we try and com- we try and tell people, we try and soften it and say and say Jesus didn't tell everybody to leave everything they had and and and, and walk with him. Uh, and you often hear preachers say, well, uh, you know, money was that guy's stumbling block. So what's your stumbling block if Jesus were to ask you to give one thing away? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I've always, I, I can see the merit in that maybe, but I've always kind of been dissatisfied with that because it, it, it seems to, it seems like, like they're trying to make it easier on us. But also, um, you know, the Bible and uh, Jesus, uh, the book of James, um, um, they decry uh, riches and rich people and, not, not that rich people are inherently bad or riches are, but it's hard to get to heaven mm-hmm. and rich people should weep. And riches are really a difficult thing. So, it, I mean, it really sounds like to me he's talking about riches itself. So I, I was just wondering what your take was on all that, maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, there's certainly a lot of places in the teaching of Jesus and in James, which depends, the book of James depends heavily on the teaching of Jesus. For example, James which is only five chapters long, has like 20 allusions to the Sermon on the Mount in that short book. So it's clear that James is giving sort of a, an expansion or a, a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. In his, now, Jesus did say in the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke's version, Luke 6, Woe unto you, rich, you, you have your consolation, and blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And Jesus did talk in another place to the rich young ruler, about selling all he had and giving to the poor. And then when he left, uh, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, none of you have left houses or lands or family or anything like that who will not receive, you know, a hundredfold more in this life and in the next. Uh, Jesus indicated at that time that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So Jesus certainly did not encourage us to say, hey, being rich is a good idea. He said it's a stumbling block. It's a burden. It can even sink you. It can destroy you. Uh, Paul said in First Timothy chapter 6, those who want to be rich fall into many hurtful and uh, sinful snares that drown him in soul in perdition. He says, having food and clothing, we should with these things be content. So Paul is, and, and Jesus and James are certainly all on the same page. And, and in fact, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says to the church of Smyrna, I know your poverty, but you are rich. In other words, they are materially poor, but they're rich in another sense. Uh, James said God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. In Revelation 3, he told the church of Laodicea, they say 
uh, I'm rich and have need of nothing. He says, you don't know that you're poor and naked and, and miserable and so forth. So, you know, there's really the New Testament does not do anything to encourage valuing wealth uh, as a pursuit at all. And if anything, when wealth is described, it's often described as a hindrance. Now, uh, on the other hand, when we look at what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if we're asking, are these instructions for everybody? In other words, does God want everybody to sell all they have and give to the poor? Then we'd have to say that a number of Jesus' closest friends were not very obedient. Even, even Peter, in that same story, said to Jesus afterwards, Lord, we have forsaken everything and followed you. And yet Peter still had a house. He still had fishing gear and fishing boat. He still had a family. And yet he had forsaken everything. So we have to ask, well, what does it mean to forsake? Now, the rich young ruler was told to sell what he has and give to the poor. Peter apparently didn't sell what he had, but he had forsaken it in whatever sense is being referred to as forsaking all. Remember, Jesus said in Luke 14, I think it's verse 33 or 34, Jesus said, if you don't forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. But what's it mean to forsake all that you have? Um, it certainly must be first and foremost a matter in the heart. You can give away all your goods and feed the poor and have not love, Paul said, and it profits you nothing. He said that in 1 Corinthians 13. So to give away everything you have to the poor and not to do it out of love would mean that you've done something, you've made yourself poor, but you haven't done it for good motives. So really the issue here is what is the motivation? Now, Peter... I believe, had forsaken everything, as he said he had. In fact, he said all the disciples had. And yet he hadn't sold everything and given it to the poor. He had some to support his family with. He had wife and probably children. And so, you know, how is it that a man who still possesses things could be said to have forsaken everything? I understand that to mean, in most people's cases, not that they literally sell everything and then go out and be homeless, which would be, if, if God told everybody, to sell everything you have and don't own anything and give everything to the poor, well then, okay, what do you do after that? You go sleep under a bridge, I guess. And if, if Jesus wants the whole church sleeping under a bridge, well, so be it. We should do it. But is that really what he's saying? We find that some of the most devoted disciples of Jesus were people like Mary and Martha, who had a house. Now, their house was available to Jesus and his disciples. It was, I think, as far as they were concerned, it was his it was, you know, my house is your house kind of a thing. I believe that they owned it. They didn't sell it and give the money to the poor, but they were truly pleasing to God because Jesus said about Mary, the younger sister, she has chosen the one thing necessary. Uh, she's chosen that which is best. And yet she hadn't chosen to sell her house. She did pour out, you know, ointment, expensive ointment, Jesus. But the question here is, when it comes to, you know, should we be poor or rich? Should we sell everything we have, give to the poor? This is more complicated than just looking at what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, because not everyone did sell everything they have and give to the poor. Even Peter didn't. And yet in the context of the story of the rich young ruler, Peter said, we have forsaken everything and followed you. And Jesus didn't deny it. He said, yeah, but you're going to receive a hundred times more. So I think that, I think the preachers are actually correct when they say, Jesus didn't tell everybody to sell everything they have and give to the poor. And, and if he did, what then are they supposed to do after that? You know, like I said, if you sell everything, you don't have a house, you don't have clothing, you don't have furniture. You, you and your kids are going to be, you know, what, sleeping in a public park um, or on Skid Row. That's not, really, that's not really a picture of what Jesus called his people to do. But he has said, that if you will not forsake all that you have, you can't be a disciple. And that certainly means something. We can't just write it off and say, well, everyone's not supposed to be poor, so we can just ignore what Jesus said. We can't ignore what Jesus said. He meant something. And I think what he meant was that to be his disciple, you have to transfer ownership of all that you have to him. You are becoming his servant. You have been bought with a price. You're not your own. Your stuff is not your own. It's all his and fell on. You do with it what he wants done with his stuff. It may seem like it's yours because you get the paycheck and you make the, the mortgage payments and so forth, but, but it's his. 
So you are now a manager of somebody else's goods, and that somebody else is Jesus. Now, if Jesus says, sell it and give it to the poor, you do it. If he says, uh, tell you what, don't sell it. Let's just use this for the kingdom of God, like Mary and Martha did with their house. Well, that's what you do. The point is, not everyone is supposed to liquidate everything. If they did, they'd soon have to go acquire things again to to cook and to clothe themselves and to wash their clothes and things like that. So to everyone's not supposed to do exactly the same thing. And there are people who are called to own essentially very little, if not nothing, and to simply go out and be missionaries like the disciples were called to do. Other people are called to work and help support those who are doing that kind of work. So I do think it's it's oversimplistic to suggest that everybody should do exactly what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do. But everybody who follows him should be willing to do so if that's what he calls them to do. And, and anyone who hasn't done so should check their own heart and say, would I do that? If I was asked to, could I do that happily? Or do I think my stuff is mine? Hey, I got to take a break, but I appreciate your call. You're listening to The Narrow Path. We are listener supported. We're going to come back for another half hour. Just going to take a short break here. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. I'll be back in 30 seconds for another half hour. Don't go away. Small is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. We're proud to welcome you to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you today, but everything to give you. When today's radio show is over, we invite you to visit thenarrowpath.com where you'll find topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and the archives of all the radio shows. Study, learn, and enjoy. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls if you have questions about the Bible or about the Christian faith. Um, We have our lines full right now, but if you want to take this number down and call later, you can maybe get through when a line opens up, as they do periodically through the show. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And uh, as I said, our lines are full, so we're going to go directly to these uh, callers. Don from Sacramento, California. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hello, Steve. Um, thank you for what you do. It's my pleasure. I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask uh, what you think about a certain question concerning John 13, verse 34, where our Lord Jesus Christ talked about loving one another as he yeah. had loved them. Mm-hmm. In, in comparison with Romans chapter 3, and my question is this, <clears throat> if two people fulfill what our Lord Jesus Christ said about loving one another as he did, had shown us, would they then be free from that pronouncement that all have sinned and uh, fall short of the glory of God? Well, the statement that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God is true of everybody, even those who have become Christians and have started to be obedient to God. We still have sin in our past, and for the, the truth is we still have some sin in our present. Uh, even if we seek to love as Jesus loved, we will not do this perfectly. Uh, and and therefore, you know, it's it's not likely that any of us will be sinless uh, for any extended period of time, we can be we can be sinless for a while in a sense. I mean that we can we can think godly thoughts and do godly things and say godly words, or say nothing at all, and we can avoid sinning for some period of time, hours maybe, maybe maybe days. I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't know how long a person can go without sinning, but you can't probably go the rest of your life without sinning, and. Uh, that's because we are weak. And and James says, in many things, we all stumble. Now, Paul does tell us that it is possible to resist temptation and that God will always faithfully give us a way of escape when we are tempted so that we don't have to succumb. But 
even though we don't have to succumb, we do much too often anyway. And that must be because we've still got a lot of perfection that we lack in terms of our motivations and also in our, our strength. We, we just don't have strong enough faith sometimes or strong enough resolve. So, you know, if people love one another, as Jesus said to do, he didn't say that that will cancel out the truth of another statement made elsewhere that all have sinned. Uh, all of us have sinned. So, no, I, I don't I don't think the, the way you stated that, I, I don't think I could agree with it. Okay. Thanks for your answer. All right. Thank you for your question. I appreciate you calling. Uh, Pat from Texas, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, thanks. Well, I like that last study you did on, on the uh, money. You, that was so good. But I oh. just wanted to ask you a question about the pulling weeds and thinking about the tares and the wheat and how yeah. Jesus said, don't pull up the tares first, you'll pull up the wheat or the root. I guess they're planted a similar time. Uh, and and uh, and I've heard people say that uh, when uh, when they make their fruit, the uh, the, the uh, wheat will bend over, but the tares are still upright. So that uh, they come along and they cut the tares first because they make the bread bitter. And uh, I, I want you to see if that's what you interpret. And and then along with that. I'm thinking about I think Matthew 24 or 25, where it's uh, after the sign of these things, after these things shall you see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the air. So people believe that we're not going to be raptured uh, first. We've got to see all that. And uh, those two things together to me is uh, the tares, the weeds, and the bitter is going to have to go first before the wheat, us, go uh, we're harvested. So what do you mm -hmm. think of all that? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I think I agree with you. Uh, there is a general sense uh, in, among many Christian evangelicals, uh, particularly those that are referred to as dispensationalists, that, um, that the church is going to be removed from the earth and the wicked are going to be left behind to go through the tribulation. But what you're saying is that in the story of the wheat and the tares, it says the wheat and the tares are going to grow together in the earth until the harvest. And then it says he's going to send his angels out and they will gather the tares, which is the weeds, uh, out. And then they'll gather the wheat. And Jesus said, so should it be in the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels forth and they will gather out of his kingdom all those who offend, all of those who are stumblers. And uh, then shall the righteous shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he says. Now, it sounds like he's saying that the righteous aren't going anywhere in particular. It's the wicked that are going to be uh, taken, removed. Likewise, later in the same chapter, which is Matthew 13, there's the story about the dragnet. And the dragnet brings in all kinds of fishes. And when they're all brought ashore, it says he sorts out the, the evil from among the good. And he keeps the good and gets rid of the evil. So, again, it's separating out the evil ones. Uh, so I'm, I'm of the opinion that you're right, that there's, there's nothing here about uh, the church going away and living in heaven or something like that and leaving behind the wicked. Uh, it actually says, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And so it looks like the, the wicked will be rooted out of it. In fact, that is stated, although the term in the Hebrew in the Old Testament is... Uh, is, it could be translated earth or land, and it could refer to the land of Israel. Nonetheless, in Proverbs chapter 2, the way we have it in, in uh, some of our English translations, it says in verse 21 and 22, the upright will dwell in the land, and the blameless will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth, and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So the hope of the Israelites in, in the Old Testament was that they would stay in the land, and God would uproot and remove the wicked. And that sounds very much like what Jesus said in those parables that would happen. Well, what about that, Matthew, about after the, these things shall you see the sign of the Son of Man coming? Is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it says that. What, those things are, are 
what we thought we'd avoid, I guess, to be raptured first or whatever. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people, when they read Matthew 24, they understand that Jesus is talking about the future seven-year tribulation, and Jesus said after the tribulation of those days, you know, the angels will be sent <laughs> out, and they'll gather. But uh, that's that's actually referring to gathering his elect together rather than the wicked. But uh, okay. I don't think that's I don't think that's reference to the rapture myself. I, I my own understanding of Matthew twenty four is somewhat different. I believe he's uh-huh. talking actually about uh, the the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy A.D., which is what he predicted at the beginning of the chapter. He began the chapter by saying the temple is going to be destroyed, and not one stone of it will be left standing on another. That actually occurred in A.D. seventy when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was dismantled. And so when Jesus, the disciples came and said, when will this take place? He gives them this long discussion about when it will take place. And then at the end of that discussion, he says in verse 34, this generation will not pass before all these things occur. So he seems to be talking about that, which would happen in that generation. The reference to the coming of the Son of Man, I believe, is apocalyptic imagery in that particular passage. I do believe in a future coming of Jesus, but I don't think that's where he's talking about it. Well, that uh, generation, um, do, you know Greek very well, so you, you know what that means. But what if it means the, t- the time that God made each thing, uh, the earth, the sun, the, uh, and the people, and uh, Adam and Eve, uh, and well, now they're, the word, they're actually yeah. talking yeah, the Greek- about... They're trying to make some kind of deal, like the search of the IT, that that we're we're somehow going to be a half man and half machine. I don't think that's the generation God's going to allow. Well, yeah, I don't think he's referring to that, though. The the Greek word that's translated generation can refer to a race of people, but right. the other the other meaning is that uh, you know a contemporary people living at the same time, the same way we speak about you know. Uh, you know, my generation was called the baby boomers. We're talking about people who were born around yeah. the same time. Uh, it can mean yeah. either one, but in the in the context, he has not made any reference to any races. When he said this race will not pass, or this generation will not well, pass. I yeah. didn't mean race. I meant uh, the actual making uh, a man. Yeah. That he's the last generation because okay. God is not going to allow a half man, half machine. That's what I think. Okay, yeah, I, I don't think it's likely that the word means that. Uh, I don't know that the oh, word, okay. Greek word has ever been taken to mean that. But, uh, that, yeah, I wouldn't see it quite that way myself. I appreciate your call, though. We've got a lot of people waiting. Let's talk to Garrison from Seattle, Washington. Garrison, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve, thank you. I appreciate your uh-huh. ministry. Um, first, I remember uh, there was a caller a couple of days ago who was talking about her grandma who was incapacitated. I uh, just wanted to let them know I was praying for that situation. Um, oh, that's good. And my, my question is um, about First Peter. It's a two-part question. If you only have time for one, that's totally fine. But in First in Peter 3.19, um, it says that Jesus preached to the spirits. It seems that they're the people who died during the flood, which is fascinating. And then uh, 1 Peter 4, 6, uh, it says the gospel is preached to the dead. Um, and then, so the first question is, does that seem to support a hope for uh, possible repentance after the grave? And then my second question is in the very next verse, 1 Peter 4, 7. Um, the end Peter of says, all things, end is, of all things is near. Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems that throughout the New Testament, um, that's the general sentiment. And yet, we are far, farther from the writing of the New Testament than they were from the Exodus. So what do they mean by the end of all things yeah. near? Right. Well, that, those are two good questions. Uh, the two verses that you refer to that sound like Jesus may have preached to people after they were dead, it, I have understood them a little differently. Uh, when it says that he preached to the spirits in prison, I think what he's saying is from the standpoint that he's writing from in probably 64 A.D. or so, the, the, the spirits of those that Jesus preached to, that he's referring to, are now in prison. That is, they're now, as it were, in Hades. They're, they've gone to you know, their reward or whatever beyond. And, but their spirits are now in prison. But it wasn't while they were there that he preached them because he says he did it through his spirit. And these were the people who were disobedient in the days of Noah. 
He's not talking about everyone who died in Old Testament times, but just the people during that period of time that Noah was building the ark. Jesus preached to them through his spirit. Now, these people are now dead, and, you know, we can refer to them as spirits who are in prison now. But uh, but I, I believe he's talking about the spirit of Christ preaching through Noah. Now, I'll give you two reasons for my thinking of this. One is that earlier in the same book, in First Peter chapter 1, he referred to the Old Testament prophets as speaking through the spirit of Christ. He says that if you look at chapter 1, uh, verses 10 through 12, it talks about the prophets, the spirit of Christ in them was prophesying. Uh, so he sees the Old Testament testimony of inspired preachers, prophets and such, as being Christ's spirit. And that's what he says here about the preaching to these people who are disobedient in the days of Noah. It says, through his spirit, he preached to them. And, and I think he means through the inspired prophet Noah. Now, another reason for thinking that is that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Old Testament do we read that Noah even preached, except Peter tells us that in Second Peter chapter 2, he calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. So Peter alone is our source of information that Noah even preached. Genesis doesn't mention Noah preaching. And therefore, we know that Peter was conscious of Noah as a preacher. He also believed the Old Testament inspired preachers were preaching through the Spirit of Christ. So I think that he's saying that Jesus, through his Spirit, preached to those people who were disobedient. Their, their spirits are now in prison today, but then they were not. They were alive when Noah preached to them inspired by the Spirit of Christ. And I see chapter 4, verse 6, similarly, where he says that he, he preached to the souls, uh, or he, for this reason he preached uh, to the dead, so that they might live according to God through the Spirit and so forth. Um, I, I tend to see that kind of the same way, that these people who are now dead were preached to in their lifetime. It says, for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, now, he says it was preached in the past to those who are now dead, present tense, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. What I think he's saying there is that people who have now died as martyrs who were judged according to men, they were martyred. They're now dead. But they, the gospel was preached to them while they were alive so that even though they were judged by men, they were vindicated by God. That is, they live according to God, through the Spirit. So I think he's saying earlier generations, or early, not generations, but earlier Christians who are now dead had the opportunity to be preached to in their lifetime so that, so that they could now have life, even though they've died under the judgment of man. Um, so I'm not seeing either of those as necessarily talking about to anyone preaching to people who are dead at the time that the preaching is being done, but people who have subsequently died. Now, the next verse, the time is, the end of all things is at hand. That's, that's a tricky one because lots of times the Bible talks about things that are near and at hand. And I, in my opinion, a lot of those passages are talking about the end of the old covenant order. And that was truly at hand at the time the New Testament was written. The Old Testament order came to its crashing down to its end and went up in flames in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed and, and the nation of Israel was destroyed and uh, you know it was fully replaced by a new covenant order. So many times when the writers say that something is at hand and it might be something where it, the way they word it sounds like it's the end of the world, sometimes I think it's not. I think sometimes they're using hyperbole to speak of, of this major transition from the old covenant to the new. On the other hand, I'm, I'm not as closed as some people are to the possibility of some of the apostles thinking the end of the world was closer than it was. The Bible nowhere indicates that the apostles were incapable of being mistaken about something like that. And Jesus had told them that they won't know. He told them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has put in his own power in Acts 1-7. And therefore, since they didn't know when it was going to happen, if they expressed an opinion, it would have been perhaps their own hopeful opinion. And uh, one might say, oh, but, but then they misled. Well, uh, all I can say is the Bible does not say that they had some inspired knowledge of when the end would be. 
And, you know, we don't either. We don't know when the end will be. But that doesn't prevent Christians from having their hopes and suggesting, you know, I think the Lord's coming soon and things like that. So, I mean, a person could take it that way. Or they could suggest that in a case like this, maybe he's talking about the end of the Jewish order, the Jewish temple order. Okay. Well, I think that's very helpful. Thank you, Steve. All right. God bless you, Garrison. Thanks for your call. Good talking to you. Uh, Susan from California, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hello. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, I just wanted your opinion on something. My grandson and his new wife came over. She attends a Pentecostal church. I brought up the subject of communion. I've been going to church for 30 years, and I never heard of a church that never celebrated communion or heard of it. She had never Mm. heard of it, neither had her elderly grandmother or anything. But this upset her. I explained to her about it. She called her pastor right then, and he said that they believe in communion with God through the Spirit, as typed in the shadows of the Old Testament, whatever that means, and taught by Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. And they said, in order to have fellowship with God, we must be a partaker of the flesh and blood of Jesus through the Spirit, as there is no spiritual life outside of him. And they believe that the literal emblems of bread and fruit of the vine used at the Passover were shadows of God and things to come. And basically, he said, we believe in partaking of the flesh and blood of the Lord through the Spirit. And, of course, they quoted scripture and all this. I don't see this as being scriptural. I've always taken communion very seriously. Have you ever heard of anything like this? You know, I, I don't think I have. I, the only the only people I've the only Christians I've ever heard of who didn't take communion as a you know a part part of the ritual of their service has been the Quakers. The Quakers, I understand, uh, did not believe in either baptism or communion, thinking them to be empty rituals, and and saw them as only corresponding to to spiritual realities. Um, I did meet once a Calvinist guy who is not typical of Calvinists, but he did say he didn't believe in water baptism. He believed it was entirely a spiritual thing. So from time to time, I have heard of people who don't believe that these, uh, these, these rituals are really part of the Christian life, but rather that just the spiritual thing that they correspond to is. Now, um, there's really no way to know exactly how much Jesus wanted, how, how often he wanted us to, to take communion physically, because he simply said, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. Mm-hmm. So presumably they could do it every day, as, as Roman Catholics sometimes do. Some Catholics take uh, the Mass every morning, uh, yeah. go to church every morning and take a Mass. Uh, or whether it just refers to being done on Sundays, or whether it's done less frequently than that, Jesus does not indicate how often it should be done, but he did say whenever it is done, it should be done in remembrance of him. He didn't sound, didn't sound to me like he's saying it, it should be entirely replaced by a spiritual thing. But again, there's no very specific instructions in scripture as to how frequently someone must do so. Now, these people obviously don't do it very much if neither this woman nor her mother had they, ever heard they, of, that's what's of it. Odd. They never do mm-hmm. it. They say yeah. they have never had communion because they don't believe well what i just said they believe yeah in. yeah and i and i've well, been in church for 30 years and i've never heard heard of a church not doing communion in mm-hmm. some regard and right i, I haven't i, I haven't either like i said except except for church anymore <laughs> yeah except for except for the quakers i'd never heard of any group yeah. that took that position I, I i certainly don't think that most pentecostals take that position although i could be mistaken about some yeah, of that surprised groups me. right well i would say this that technically um you know, I don't, I don't know that they're violating a direct command of Scripture because, again, we're not told that it has to be done with any frequency. But uh, on the other hand, it is a, a, a great departure from what the church has always done from the earliest days until now. It certainly has been the case that the church has included what they call the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or communion or something as part of their service at least some of the time. Now, the church I was raised in only did it once a month. Uh, yes, that was a Baptist church. Either. And, uh, you know, Presbyterian churches, some of them, only do it four times a year, so every three months. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's obvious that there's different opinions about how often it should be done. But on the other hand, uh, you know, Jesus didn't say how often. So apparently, you know, I don't think that we have to take communion in order to have our sins forgiven or in order no, I, to I receive that. grace. Yeah. 
but uh, but it's something we do to remember Christ. Yes. And, I would say it's uh, scriptural, though, to do it. I mean, I feel it is. I feel mm-hmm. like it's a church. I mean, they don't even acknowledge it at this church. They, yeah. They just well, that's do it clear certainly out the is door, unusual. And I don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah, I wonder if they practice baptism or not. Usually, I, I, you know, that was going to be my next question when I yeah. see them. I, I wondered the same thing. Protestants usually do, and, and Pentecostals are Protestants, uh, yes. generally speaking. But Protestants generally acknowledge two, uh, you know, of these uh, practices. The, the Roman Catholics have seven what they call sacraments. Um, but uh, Protestants usually practice baptism and communion. But on a rare occasion, you find some groups that don't. Well, this is All right. Rare. All right. Yeah, I've got to take another call because we're almost out of time, but I, I, I do appreciate your call. Thank you. Uh, let's talk next to Chuck from Las Vegas, Nevada. Chuck, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, hello. Hi. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I just uh, basically I got like three questions. They're all about the same thing. It'll be short answers. And it mentions uh, Nimrod, in the, of course, in the Bible. And is it true that Nimrod married his mother, and that's the uh, goddess Diana? And then uh, well, the other two, too. Asherith, you know, and, and is that another right. name, Easter, for uh, for uh, Di- Diana, the goddess Diana? And also, I don't know if this is hearsay or not, I heard that one of their ceremonies was to collar the eggs of sacrificed children. Have you ever heard of that? I've, I've heard things like that. I mean, Nimrod... Some people say Nimrod did uh, marry Semiramis, uh, who was his mother, according to certain Babylonian mythology. And um, I don't know the details of Babylonian mythology. I don't really, it's not one of my areas of expertise to know all the things that are taught by pagan nations about their deities. But uh, I have heard things like that. Now, some of what I heard about that years ago, back in the 70s, came from a book called the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And yet his work, the quality of his work has been called into question and, and the results of his findings have, uh, have been more or less mocked by many modern scholars. So I don't know what the nature is of that because, it's again, it's not a subject that I'm very focused on. I think people who bring it up are usually trying to point out that you know some of the things that are done both in the Christmas celebration traditionally and the Easter celebration traditionally of the church have been borrowed from pagan sources. And I don't think there's any real doubt about that, that some, some, some of the things that are done, like the Easter bunny and coloring eggs and things like that, uh, and in, in terms of Christmas, some of the, some of the things that are uh, you know, practiced in some households at Christmas uh, have come down to us from uh, non-Christian sources, non-Christian religions. And this is taken by some to be a very good reason not to practice them as Christians. But there's another way of looking at it, too, and that is that it may be that coloring eggs and, uh, you know, having bunnies or whatever associated with them is something that has no Christian origins and might have pagan origins. But people today who do that are thinking about Christian ideas. They're not thinking about pagan ideas. They're they're not worshiping any pagan gods through these. Maybe people did thousands of years ago, but they don't now. We actually have pagan gods' names in the days of our week and in the names of our months, but we don't think of those pagan gods when we use those names. Uh, We could say those things have been redeemed, as it were, in Christian history, and that's how some people view it. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. We are listener-supported. If you go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, you'll find much free resources, but also you can donate there if you wish at thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us.